Hi everyone, this is Arkady Freckman. I'm a New York City personal injury trial attorney and welcome to Last Week Tonight where we answer your questions and we talk about your comments. Here's a, a comment from by YT533 and he or she says, you make learning look easy. So thank you so much. That's a really nice thing to say and let us know what content you wanna see. We can make a video, we can answer your question live or through this last week tonight where we go through your comments for the past week or you could always text me 347-566-9595. Just let me know your name, the facts, the injuries, the city, and then I can get back to you. We could schedule a free confidential consultation and we could chat and I've been helping people. So here's a comment from Trucking with Toby and she says, just wanted to let you know the FMCSA, that's the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Act, requires a minimum of 750,000 in coverage in most states. And she's responding to my video, answering your frequently asked questions, personal injury settlements for a truck accident. See, I don't remember that. It might've been an old video. I might've said that most trucks have a million, but she's right. Yeah, some trucks only have 750, especially trucking companies where it's an owner operator and they only have one truck. I've seen a lot of those where it's only 750. Whereas the larger companies that have, let's say 40 trucks, 100 trucks, they'll have usually a million with excess or umbrella, like another 5 million, 10 million, they'll have layer upon layer. So those are always uh, good cases, but 750 is still a significant amount. And then Matthew Riley responds to a short where I asked if the police can demand that you get out of your car. This is more of a criminal issue. And he says, they cannot ask you to exit your vehicle because they think it's suspicious. Suspiciousness or sus being suspicious is not a crime. They have to articulate a crime that you were or are engaged in. Ask if you are detained. And if you don't get out, will I be arrested? And if they say yes, then you have standing in court fight for your rights because they will violate them. Okay, so that's a lot of legal insight right there from Matthew Riley. I don't know if he's a lawyer or if he's just an informed citizen, but that's some good knowledge there that he shared. That's really on, on point. Okay, and then Deborah DeSanto asks, she says, thanks for the video, and she's referring to back injuries and your personal injury lawsuit. Um, and she asks, I have a question, is a failed laminectomy worth anything. Another doctor told me I might need more surgery. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. If you have a surgery because of an injury, let's say a trip and fall, a car crash, and then the surgery fails, then you need a second surgery, either a revision or just a different type of procedure. And that can make the case worth a lot more because now you're having two surgeries. And there's something known as natural sequelae, whereas even if you think and people tell you, hey, you need the second surgery, let's say, because of a doctor's mistake. Well, the law in New York says that a doctor's mistake, medical malpractice, is foreseeable, meaning it's one of the possibilities. And it all goes back and it all flows from the initial event, such as the truck crash that required you to go on this you know, course of treatment. So it all, you could sue for everything, basically, back to the original event. You don't need to sue for medical malpractice. You can, but that makes it more complicated. If there is you know, medical malpractice or some other cause, it's better to just let it all as natural sequelae flow from the original event, the truck crash, the car crash, the trip and fall, whatever it is, and you can recover for everything. For example, the case we did last August involved exactly that. It was a fusion to C4, C5, C5, C6, a two-level fusion, and there was something known as non-union, where after a fusion, you hope that the bone bridges or unifies above and below, and although you lose mobility, you can't move your neck, but you have the fusion, the unity, and that's what you want, right? And you put a plate with screws in there. But what happened in this case was it didn't unify. It was a non-union. And so he needed another surgery and it couldn't do the same surgery, just a C5, C6 anterior cervical discectomy infusion, which was the original surgery, but they had to do a more complex surgery. They had to do an anterior approach from C3 all the way down to T1, which is C3, C4, C4, C5, C5, C6, C6, C7, um, you know, C7, T8, and C8, T1. It's like a six level fusion 
that's a serious surgery. And they had to do a posterior approach and put in like rods in the posterior side as well as the anterior. So that's much, much, much more invasive. And it all flowed back to the original incident, which was a slip and fall in my case. So that's one of the reasons we were able to settle that case after opening statement and after the first witness during trial for $3.5 million, which was a significant amount. So it definitely increases value. And then we have a question from Derek. He says, could you do a video on how you work with an economist and a life care planner? What would each do to help a case? What exactly is it that you do that gives you an advantage in settlement and trial and choosing when to use either one of these in a case? Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to do that. He's responding to our video about unlocking secrets, the EDR and the role of the EDR in uh, truck accidents. But he's asking about these economic damages, right? So, I mean, I could do a video just about that, but briefly, an economist, what the economist would do is calculate your lost wages, past and future, past meaning from the date of the incident up until the trial, future meaning from the date of the trial for the rest of your life based on uh, life expectancy tables and averages, and also medical costs. But the economist doesn't know the medical costs, so that's where you would need either a doctor to say, for example, physical therapy is $100 a session and I recommend physical therapy three times a week, or prescriptions are you know, X cost and I recommend these medications, or a future let's say fusion is $150,000 surgery and you may need one, or sometimes after a fusion, there's uh, something known as adjacent segment disease where by uh, medically it's known that you're going to need this, right? Like you had a fusion at C5, C6. Well, the adjacent segments would be C4, C5 and C6, C7. And you're going to need those two medically. The probability is there with a reasonable degree of medical certainty. Maybe not now, maybe in 10 or 15 years, but that's another 150,000 for one, 150,000 for another. And then the economist will you know, talk about the present value as well as what the costs will be over your life. So they work together, the doctors with the economists. And a life care planner works much the same way. If it's a serious injury, like a traumatic brain injury, the life care planner will either be a doctor or work with a doctor to come up with all these costs and almost like plan out your care uh, for the future. So that's a very uh, powerful thing. And you could get a lot of economic damages. I still think the biggest damages are going to be the non-economic damages, the pain, the suffering, the mental anguish, the emotional consequences of the injury and the loss of enjoyment of life. But the economic damages can be very big as well. And then Viral Guy says, my case is going to trial. What is a final pre-trial conference? Is that a good or a bad or yeah, so I mean, I think it's good. I mean, it's not really good or bad. It's just a, par a part of the process, right? You have the lawsuit process, basically the stages of a lawsuit, how a lawsuit flows. And what part of the process is a pretrial conference. And a final one is just that, right? It's the last one before trial. So it's an attempt to settle. It's an attempt to discuss the trial, maybe have a, uh, you know, trial exhibits or any issues um, that may come up before trial. And if there are no issues, then the judge will just tell you the trial date. And if the parties are still too far apart and a settlement can't be agreed upon, then you'll just go to trial. So it's, uh, yeah, we, we, we do a lot of those at pretrial conferences. Here's a question from Jody, and she says, how do I find out the excess and umbrella coverage? Should my attorney disclose this to me? But yeah, I mean, that, that's basically you just ask for the excess and umbrella, like in New York, they're supposed to tell you even as a claim before you file a lawsuit. According to insurance law, I believe it's 4520F, they have to tell you the primary and the excess. Now, some states, they don't have to tell you, but when you file a lawsuit, they do. So you just ask for a demand. You just say, please tell me all of the policies, including the primary, the excess, the umbrella, the supplemental, the concurrent, or any other policy other than the policy that you previously disclosed. Because usually when you file a lawsuit, they're going to disclose some policy. They might say, our policy is 250 k Well, that, now they've disclosed the primary auto policy. But then that's why you ask, do you have any other policies like umbrella excess other than the one that you already told me about, right? And then they might say, oh yeah, we do. By the way, we have a $5 million excess policy. Sometimes the excess policy is with the same carrier. Sometimes it's with a different carrier. Like I'm working on a case now where there's a million with one carrier and then they have 25 million with another carrier. So um, they don't like to get into the excess and the attorney that defends the case 
wants to be a hero, so he wants to settle the case within the primary, even save money off the primary, so that he could go back to his boss and say, look, I'm a hero. Not only did I not pay the million, I paid like, for example, 900, I saved you 100K off the million, and we didn't even touch 25 million in excess. Go ahead, keep investing that to make your billions, right? So remember, they always think about their bottom line, but if you have a trial lawyer, you could push their buttons, you could you know, push through and, and get money. Uh, so definitely find that out. And uh, yeah, and if you have any questions, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly about, you know, it's hard to answer from a text, but best thing to do is just text me, 347-566-9595. We could jump on a call and I'm happy to help. Here's a question from Dwayne Carter. He says, hello. I had my deposition yesterday and about an hour after I was done, my lawyer called me and told me I did an outstanding job. It was a damages only deposition. That means they only ask about your injuries and your medical treatment, your damages. In your experience, do most cases settle after a deposition? I mean, yeah, it's hard to say, you know, without really reviewing your case and knowing like what he wants to settle for and what the history has been and the offers and everything. But yeah, I mean, most cases do settle after depositions. Depositions are essential because that's the defendant's, a uh, defense lawyer and the insurance company's opportunity to find out what the case is all about, right? They wanna ask you what happened and get the facts to see if you uh, have any liability, if you're at fault or if someone else is at fault, like their client. And if you establish that it's their client, the person you're suing that is at fault, then you have to establish your injuries. Have you been going to the doctor all along? Are there huge gaps or holes in your treatment where you didn't go anywhere for a year? That could be bad, right? Or do you not know where you went? Like, I don't know any doctors, I don't remember anything. Well, that's not good because then they could say, well, look, this guy, if he gets in front of a jury, he doesn't even know anything. He doesn't even know where he went. So that makes your case worse. On the flip side, if you can explain and tell stories about how this has affected your life and how your relationships and your things you love to do and the people you love have all been changed and it's a real serious life-changing injury, then they could see that as powerful and think, wow, a jury's gonna really understand and relate to this. This is really gonna resonate with them. This, this could be a case where we get hit for millions and millions of dollars. So then they'll be rather settle with you than take that risk of you going to court and hitting them for that much money. So that's usually how it plays out. Here's a question from Barthrop, and he says, oh my God, this is my case, responding to spinal fusion, boosting your injury case value. And he says, lots of injections for back pain, and then a percutaneous surgery that did not work, and then a fusion surgery, and Mr. Freckman and his amazing team are taking care of it. All my hope is in his hands, and I'm pretty sure, and a thousand percent positive that we and his team are gonna get me what I deserve for this life-changing surgery. Oh yeah, absolutely, let's do it. Absolutely, we're gonna get as much as possible. Just text me anytime, you know, let's chat. Um, and absolutely, we're, we're happy to help. Here's a question from Trucking with Toby, and she says, hit head on in my semi by another semi. I was going 65 miles per hour. Not sure how fast the other semi truck was going, but it seemed fast. I have a concussion a herniated disc in my lower back, broken ribs, a collapsed lung on the lower left lobe, serious lacerations and bruising to both legs, whiplash, and the spine is out of alignment. And he completely destroyed my semi truck and trailer. And I'm an owner operator, so it destroyed my business too. I'm losing $1,500 for every missed load, five loads per week, 20 loads per month. So do the math on how much money I'm losing. Do I have a strong case? The man that caused the crash died at the scene. There were witnesses that stated he was all over the road five miles before the crash. Highway was closed basically all day. Major freeway between Vegas and Phoenix. Deadly two-lane road. They call that road the Blood Alley. I'm very lucky to be alive. Oh my God, yeah, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's just horrific. But yeah, you would have a strong case. now. You'd want to know which trucking company it was, and you'd want to uh, preserve all the evidence and have maybe a truck safety expert go out and see if there's anything wrong with the truck or identify the cause. Uh, you'd want to file a lawsuit against the truck, obviously find out how much primary and excess coverage they have. If it's a large trucking company, they could have layers and layers, like a million primary, but then another five or 10 million uh, excess and umbrella, and it could go on for, for a bit. And then of course, you would get an economist to prove these lost wages that you mentioned, 
and loss of business profits since you're an owner operator and have your own business. And then I would recommend seeing the right doctors, maybe near your home for the concussion because a concussion can be a traumatic brain injury. So you could see a neurologist, a neuroradiologist to do a scan such as an MRI or a diffusion tensor imaging, a DTI, as well as a neuropsychologist that could run some tests and see if you're having any symptoms like memory loss, difficulty concentrating, or other symptoms of a head injury. And then for the other injuries like the herniated disc, of course there's pain management like injections or possible need for surgery, the collapsed lung, um, they probably they would treat that at the hospital and the serious lacerations and bruising. But it sounds like a very, very serious case. So the best thing to do is just to text me. That way we could get on a free confidential consultation. I could answer any questions. And if you end up needing a lawyer out there in Vegas or Phoenix or um, you know, in either Nevada or Arizona, I know some of the top trial lawyers of both states, so I could recommend someone. So it's uh, 347-566-9595. Okay, I hope this was helpful. Please like and subscribe to our channel. Let us know what questions you have. We are here for you and uh, all the best. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.